go to our first caller. It's David in South Woodford. Hello, David. Oh, good evening. Um, my question is, given that our government may have received official legal advice that Israel is committing war crimes and having not imposed an arms embargo, uh, is our government serving Netanyahu more than the reputation of the UK? When you say may have received legal advice, what, what's your basis for alleging that? Well, well uh, we have the uh, the the uh, the, uh, the uh, leaked recording of the ch- chairperson of the Foreign Select Committee uh, confirming that the government had received official legal advice. And that's Alicia Cairns, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. She said in mid-March that the government's own lawyers had told her that Israel is breaking humanitarian law. The Shadow Foreign Secretary David Lammy has today urged his opposite number, David Cameron, to publish that legal advice. Um, Gavin Ezra, let's come to you first on, on this. Um, if that indeed that advice has been given, it would seem extraordinary that several weeks later nothing has changed. Yes, it's a big if. I'd like to, I'd like to know the details, as you would, obviously, um, Ian. Uh, we are at a, a real turning point here. I think it is perfectly possible to think of the horrors that those Israelis suffered in October, to think of the real awful horrors the Palestinians uh, have been suffering since, and to think of the aid workers who've also died, and to think, at last, maybe we need to do something slightly differently. Because what strikes me is... When you say we, or do we, you mean I mean, I, I mean the United Kingdom. Okay. Uh, I, I mean the United Kingdom. There is a growing weight of opinion in this country that something should be done about arms sales to Israel. And I would just put it slightly differently. You know, I, I was in Washington when Yitzhak Rabin, then the leader of Israel, sat down with the Palestinians, with Yasser Arafat, and came up with what we thought was going to be a two-state solution to this terrible, terrible tragedy that's been going on for generations. And he was assassinated by someone who was an Israeli, uh, who didn't like what he was doing. And what I fear now is that Benjamin Netanyahu is leading and has led Israel into a terrible, terrible situation now. And this has become a war for his political survival. And it is not a war which around the world is being seen as being fought in a just way by Israel. And that seems to me to present those people who think that Israelis have a right right to exist within secure borders in a very difficult position. And Netanyahu, just one final point on this, before this happened, there were massive demonstrations by Israelis saying this man is not fit. Which is still going on now. Which is still going on now during the war. So I think we should listen to those voices and think that actually support for Netanyahu has got to be Uh, cut out. And I mean support for Netanyahu. And one of the ways of sending a signal about that is to say that arms shipments uh, can't continue from the United Kingdom. And it's interesting that Benny Gantz, who's a a member of Netanyahu's war cabinet, has today called for early elections. But of course, there's a possibility that, um, okay, Netanyahu might well lose that election, but who replaces him? Sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. You do. And also, at a time of war, people who are scared, as many as within the Israeli population must be right now too, uh, may choose to vote for some of the extreme parties which are not going to contribute to peace. But we have got, this to me is absolutely a clear turning point and it's time for the British government to think which way to turn. And we could also listen to what's happening in the Biden administration too, which is far from enthusiastic about supporting Netanyahu, whereas of course it supports the idea of Israel's existence absolutely. Um, Michael, what what do you make of the developments over the last 48 hours and particularly the reaction of the British government? Because I think it's fair to say that over the past month, six weeks, two months maybe, the British government has become, so shall we say, much more Israel sceptic. Yes. Da- David Cameron's language in particular has become, has been relatively critical given that Israel is a, is a bit major ally of this country. Yeah, I think that's where I'm coming from. Uh, we were having a conversation uh, before we came in uh, with Gavin about our own experiences of uh, Palestine, Israel. My father was one of those who survived the uh, bombing when he was a serviceman aged 20 in 1946 outside the King David Hotel. He was very anti-Semitic. Uh, I reacted as a, as a boy, always on the side of Israel. I've always had very good links with the Conservative Friends of Israel. Uh, I'd met a number of the people like Gavin, uh, Yikta, uh, uh, Shamir, uh, Rabin, when he was leader of the opposition. 
I met a young backbench MP called Netanyahu in 1986, and I agree that uh, this is very much Netanyahu's uh, doing, and I think that the patience of Britain, even friends of Israel like me, that our friendship is being strained to the limit. And I think that um, uh, there is going to be Biden and certainly David Cameron, full marks to him. Uh, I've noticed a change, especially uh, a, a hardening, which I think he drives the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak on. Um, on the question of imports, exports of arms, there was an item on the World at One this afternoon where the actual amount of arms mm -hmm. that we send isn't very much, <laughs> but there is a phenomenal trade the other way Ironically, Israel does produce a lot of armaments which get exported. Uh, and I think that maybe trade sanctions are going to have to be considered. It's very, very sad because uh, this is a one-man war. Biden said right at the outset, be very, very careful that you don't make a mistake now, which mm. you'll regret. And I think the uh, friends of Israel are being driven, namely the Americans and the British, to absolute distraction. And I think that... Uh, uh, like you, mm. I can't see anything other than a survivalist mentality of Netanyahu, Netanyahu personally that I think is going to uh, find world pressure on him, if not Israel as a country. Richard Powell, what, what do you make of things? I, I'm quite interested in also the fact that you and Sarah are from a different generation than the three of us. And I, I do think there is a sort of a, a generational issue here where younger people I think tend to be more supportive of the Palestinian argument whereas older people I think maybe because they have memories of the of the war and the, I'm not saying that we're old enough to remember the war but you, <laughs> know, what, you know what I mean. Um, I can but, remember uh, the six day war uh, in the 1960s I was a 16 year old kid and all of our classmates were pro-Israel against yeah. nasty uh, General yeah, well, Nasser I think, I, Egypt. Think, I think that's changed now. Yes. Well, the Six-Day War was uh, around the time that my grandmother was living in Israel in one of the kibbutzim, and she came back to Britain, and fast forward a few decades, um, you know, she taught me to really believe in the state of Israel as a Jewish state, not because 1948 and the creation of the state of Israel had been fair or just or, or peaceful, but because it was there and because it was the, the source and the root of safety for Ashkenazi Jews like her and, of course, the Savardim, excuse me, hitting the mic. And at the same time, my grandmother was absolutely committed to Palestinian statehood and she was committed to Palestinian statehood for exactly the reasons that she believed in the Jewish state. She knew that this was a, a displaced and vulnerable people who needed the state that was going to keep them safe. They needed something that they would have a stake in, something that they would be able to invest politically and socially in. And she was appalled by the way that nationalist, deeply racist, militarizing nationalist elites in uh, in Palestinian political uh, life and in Israeli political life increasingly were dominating both of those societies, militarizing both of those societies. She was appalled by that. She was committed to Palestinian statehood precisely because she was a Zionist, and those have always been my principles. I thought one of the most interesting and striking things uh, said today, um, but also one of the most facile things said today, was by Bob Seeley, uh, the Tory MP, who on the one hand um, was saying that anybody uh, who um, thought that we should be uh, stopping arms, uh, arm exports uh, to Israel was just involved in, in, in wokery and um, uh, moral, uh, some kind of moral justice uh, issue, which I thought was the facile Bit. But the very interesting thing that he said was that we shouldn't be uh, ending our arms exports to Israel because we need the intelligence that we get from Israel. And I thought that that actually was ultimately telling us what British foreign policy has been based on for a long time. It's a really fundamental misunderstanding of where the world is going. Um, you know, we are literally allowing Israel to fire F-16 missiles that possibly have been made in the UK at Britain's. Um, and then we're saying that we need to let them do that for the sake of getting their intelligence. That, that's always been the argument about selling arms to Saudi Arabia as well, in that we need the Saudis to fight terrorism. Right. And I think that if we actually ask ourselves, uh, where is power going in that region? What do we expect to be happening in the next 10 years? I mean, 
it doesn't particularly fill me with pleasure or glee to say it, but the US is going to be far less powerful in 10 years, 20 years. And if we think that this incredibly simplistic, um, there's kind of NATO and its friends and everybody else view of the world is still going to predominate, then we're just wrong. We've got to understand that, you know, until very recently, Israel was trying to make friends with Russia and China. Okay, that's been put off for the, for the uh, you know, the short to medium term. But... Um, there is a, a total transformation of power relations in that region at the moment, and we can't play by the old rules. Sarah? I think it's really interesting to see the, the, the journey, let's say, of the British public's viewpoint on this. As obviously on the 7th of October, we were all so shocked and just the horror that we witnessed that unfortunately was pretty much live streamed. And I think our support was so much with Israel. But as time has gone on and we've seen the very aggressive stance that Israel has taken, it's almost seemed too forceful um, to the people of Gaza. And I think that's developed how we're viewing things. And obviously over the last 48 hours with the death of three people who are working for an aid organisation, it really does shift well, let's remember your view. Well, seven people. Three seven of, three people in total, sorry, three of whom were British. It makes it feel very much on our shores, doesn't it? And I think that's what kind of shifts people. Certainly as someone who used to work for an Israeli organisation, has been very supportive of, of Israel, but very much keen on a two-party state solution. My viewpoint in the last couple of months has really begun to change in thinking, well, we can't just keep bombing. We can't just keep doing that to the poor people of Gaza. There's got to be some hope for a two-state solution moving forward and for the people of Palestine to have something to have after this war's finished. Well, we could spend the whole hour talking about this, but given that we spent the last hour talking about it, and I think one or two people, um, judging by my text, are rather fed up with the amount that we talk about it. But to my mind, if it's in the headlines, you have to talk about it. You, you can't just ignore it because you talked about it all, all day yesterday.